to introduce Dr. Scott Renshaw, uh, who is a mathematical and computational sociologist specializing in social network analysis with research interest in communication dynamics, belief formation, and hazards and disasters. He is a current postdoctoral research associate at the Center for Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity, also known as the Ideas Center, under Professor Kathleen Carley. With that, I turn it to Dr. Renshaw. So Dr. Renshaw, if you could share your screen. Thank, and, thank you so much for the introduction. I would also ask everyone else to please uh, stay muted through the presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat option. I will monitor the chat. And of course, we will have Q&A after Dr. Renshaw's presentation. Please, Dr. Renshaw. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Scott Renshaw. Thank, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm, I'm super happy and excited to uh, to be back. Last time I was here, I did, some, I did a presentation on um, some hazards and disasters research. And I mentioned the uh, the conspiracy theory belief stuff and, and y'all were really interested. So I'm happy to be back and be presenting it. Um, so what I'm be presenting today is um, some work that's ongoing. Um, it's, it's in earlier stages. And so looking for feedback, looking for thoughts um, and kind of next steps. And so this is uh, on high tension beliefs and entailment network analysis of anti-vax, climate change, QAnon, and other anti-scientific beliefs. So overview of the talk, it's common, you know, we're, we're going through background literature, data and methods, results, and then discussion in future directions. And I hope to, you know, at the end, kind of have a, in the Q&A, kind of what other things can we, can we do, can I do, um, and also how can this be applied to other uh, data? Um, so for background and literature, um, there's been a rise in mis- and disinformation. Um, this has been an alarming increase in anti-scientific belief sentiment, science denialism. At this point, um, recently, Political dubbed uh, this period the golden age of conspiracy theories. Um, science denialism obviously poses a, a significant threat to various fields, and, and one that I'm kind of really interested in um, and coming off of the COVID-19 pandemic um, is public health. Um, these anti-vax beliefs, specifically, um, we're seeing rises in, in um, diseases that we had mostly under control um, in the United States. And so this is obviously alarming that there are impacts to these uh, this mis and disinformation and conspiracy theories. Um, so there's been also calls for understanding this. So Douglas et al. talked about the importance and, of the Im and impact of uh, conspiracy theories on social and political outcomes, um, especially elections. Um, and there's also been a work that has been asking for us to uh, do research that has robust descriptive analysis and can allow us to kind of do testing of policy implications. And I hope that in the future, maybe not today, this is, you know, future stuff, um, we can use the kind of thing I'm doing to, to implement uh, policy um, kind of simulation studies. And so the, re the kind of the humble research questions and goals for today is um, how are conspiracy theories and beliefs interrelated at the U.S. population level? Um, and this is from data from uh, around 2020. And um, of those beliefs, which ones might be the most amenable to uh, intervention? Which ones could we potentially uh, do a campaign on and it maybe is less embedded um, overall? So conspiracy theories in general can sometimes be you know, playful and, and you know, harmless. Stanley Kubrick uh, you know, did the, the uh, record, uh, film The Moon Landing um, and I recently I did this talk in uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, of course, the Bigfoot hoax, um, you know, it's, it can be kind of cute. There are also ones that can be funny. So this is the birds aren't real uh, uh, conspiracy theory, probably not an actual conspiracy theory, but um, kind of a pseudo conspiracy theory. Um, but then you have some that aren't so funny. Uh, you know, this on the left, we have a QAnon rally in which individuals uh, showed up to watch uh, JFK come back from the dead. Um, yeah. And uh, on the right, we have uh, January 6th. And these are all mobilized in relation, especially to uh, conspiracy and QAnon sort of beliefs. Um, 
So one of the framings I really want to do today and with this research is kind of talking about something called the high tension belief. Um, so, and I think all of these beliefs from really kind of extreme beliefs to uh, more mundane beliefs can be seen on this spectrum of, high, of, of tension. Um, and, the te and so this was first brought up in uh, Stark and Bainbridge's uh, work on a theory of religion. It was trying to understand axiomatically uh, religion and cults and how do you understand kind of the common more common religious orientations with more extreme or more sec um, more fringe beliefs or religions um, and so they kind of frame it as conventional religious tradition versus beliefs that are religious beliefs and traditions that are at tension with the socio-cultural environment um, and so I, I like this framing versus kind of just oh it's a conspiracy or not is it allows us to look at beliefs that haven't been debunked um, or have fraught kind of political kind of conversation. And it allows us to put that under one umbrella. Um, it also, um, you know, allows us, it allows just a single framing that doesn't, I think at some level, because there are beliefs that haven't been officially debunked, um, it can also help us to convince other people in our research if we're not immediately labeling something as, you know, especially if it's a fraught ongoing kind of conversation. Uh, so um, one of the main points of what my research will kind of bring to bear is this idea of a, of a mental model. And so Ke Kenneth Crack was the first to use the term. Um, and I really love this quote by Forrester that kind of uh, summarizes what a mental model is. So the image of the world around us, which we carry in our heads is just a model. Nobody in his head imagines all the world, government or country. He has only selected concepts and relationships between them and uses those to represent the real system. And I think that's something that um, I, I'm trying to leverage with taking uh, these beliefs and understanding them at the U.S. aggregate population level. So um, in terms of uh, belief uh, networks, there's been a lot of research done um, in the, especially in the area of uh, networks. Um, so we have mental network maps in the 90s. Uh, we have in the late 80s and 90s uh, sociocognitive networks. Um, we also have uh, several studies that while they wouldn't call themselves a, a belief network or a mental model, they get at this sense of a mental model by try, uh, through studying concepts and, and beliefs um, in culture. And so uh, there's Gutman, Coombs. Uh, a lot of these studies are focused on the kinds of pairing of, of items or beliefs to try to understand the, the hierarchical nature of those uh, concepts or beliefs. Um, and I'm gonna be leveraging a lot of that in the research that I'm doing. And uh, Romney et al. Uses, uh, kind of talks about culture as shared cognitive representations. So if every single person, if you take their aggregate kind of response to the survey and you look at that aggregate, what you're seeing is kind of an aggregate uh, mental model for the population that, uh, that you're studying. So for methods and data, um, we're going to be leveraging the NPR Ipsos 2020 poll. So this was con con uh, conducted right after the um, this is connected right after the uh, 2020 election. So a lot of the topics and uh, the questions are really heavily related to the election and and that sort of thing, um, which I think is is a good thing. It was a, a lot of these beliefs were really in everyone and in, in present in, in a lot of the respondents' minds. Um, and so it's a sample of around uh, 1,200 adults age 18 plus from the continental United States, Hawaii, and Alaska. And it's a pretty good mix of Republicans and Democrats with some independent uh, voters. So um, kind of has a good balance. Um, it asks questions on belief statements. Um, so do you believe that there's a Satan worshiping uh, cabal of elites running a sex ring? Um, that humans never landed on the moon? Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. So these are some of those questions. Um, there's also questions about trust in, a, in particular named officials. We have, um, do you trust uh, Joe Biden? Do you trust Tucker Carlson? Do you trust Anthony Fauci? Um, and there was also other uh, demographic info and other questions about other topics. COVID-19, concern with uh, foreign um, uh, manipulation on social media, misinformation. And so for the for a later analysis, when, when this is published, that will be included. But for today, I'm just going to kind of hone in on the um the high tension beliefs. Um, sorry, I know it's exciting. Well, we'll maybe invite me back when that's <laughs> that's done. Um, 
So I'm going to focus on the belief and trust uh, 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 items today. So uh, the type of analysis I'll be doing, drawing on that earlier research, as I mentioned, is something called structural entailment analysis. And so um, in the it was pioneered by an anthropology in the 70s, and it takes survey response data to try to understand the hierarchical nature within the, the response patterns. Um, so White and McCann in 1988 discussed these three patterns of entailment. So there's obviously inclusion. So this is if A, then B, or if B, then A, or both. Exclusion is if B, if B then not A, and if A, then not B. And co-exhaustion is if not A, then B, if not B, then A. And so on the right, um, this article by Jasney and Fisher, I think really uh, it's one of the more recent uses of it um, after about 30, you know, 20 or 30 years of, of, not, of not being used as a method. Um, and you can see that there are, it's the patterns between um, in the in the two by two table um, on the on the diagonal and and, and that. So um, that's where the, the the relationship is coming from. And you can have a cutoff, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so again, you then you start with your individual survey responses. You then do a cross tabulation uh, of the responses showing the structure in the population. And then you find a relationship based on some uh, cutoff criteria, which is a, a binomial test. Um, the belief questions, so there's a, there's several of them. I'm not going to go over every single one right now, but some of them are like uh, belief that vaccines cause autism, belief that several mass shootings in recent years were staged as hoaxes, um, steel beams, belief that 9-11 attacks were not perpetrated by 19 terrorists from Al-Qaeda, um, and beliefs that human uh, do not play a significant role in climate change. Um, the package, the way that I'm, I'm analyzing this is through a, a package by uh, my uh, old grad school advisor, Carter Butts, uh, Tools for Latent Discrete structure, structure Analysis. And S so because SEA requires uh, dichotomized responses, um, I, you then have to take the, the responses to these questions and kind of combine them. So for trust, I'm considering uh, people who believe in or trust someone a great deal or a fair amount is true. Otherwise, they don't trust that person. Um, and a belief, if you hold that belief, it's true. Otherwise, it's false. Um, and this is, uh, we're using a, a one-sided binomial t-test. In prior literature, and so Jasney and Fisher, they use a, a, a there is no, uh, standardized method of, of doing this. Um, they use a pretty a, a reasonable uh, a cutoff, um, but I really wanted to use a, a conservative cutoff that would show kind of like the backbone of the belief network. I don't, I want to know what the durable relationships are, and there might be other kinds of relationships that are weaker, but I want to know really at the, at the end of the day, what are the strong relationships that are, 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 are happening? So moving on to some results. So here's a belief network. We're, this is focusing on just the mutual exclusions. Um, and so if we look at this, we look at the beliefs as the red dots and the um, individuals as the, uh, the green dots. We see that um, if I believe that Obama was born in the US, so if I hold this belief, I don't believe that COVID was made in a lab. If I believe that Obama was born in the US, I don't trust Trump. If I trust Trump, I don't trust Joe Biden. So at the end of the day, this one, this one little snippet is kind of like a sanity check, right? We would obviously think there's going to be some sort of uh, polarized, I trust one person, I don't trust someone else, um, especially politically, we're going to, we would expect to see that. Um, moving on. Um, so the, for the mutual co-exhaustions, um, this says, if I don't trust Donald Trump, I do trust Fauci, and that's vice versa. So if I trust uh, Fauci, I don't trust uh, Donald Trump. Um, if I if I don't trust uh, Fauci, I believe that the majority of the protests in 2020 were violent, and I also believe that COVID was made in a lab. So you can start to see that there are relationships between uh, trusting an official and either believing or not believing in something. And so that's something that I think it, you know, we'll, we can talk about as a potential future, um, you know, there are these political figures buttress or protect from certain beliefs. 
Um, and so if I don't hold these, I do trust Fauci. So then getting to the bigger, the, the really the meat of it and the most, I I think the most interesting um, is the implications. So if I, if I hold that belief A, I also hold belief B. What we find is when you take that super conservative cutoff, you get two really clear clusters and the two clusters are really Republican and Democrat. Um, you see at the bottom, there's Joe Biden in the center of this cluster and Trump at the center of this cluster. So another kind of uh, relationship you're seeing is when you really pare down the and you're looking at only the durable backbone, you do see this 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 um, kind of separation. Um, this is one network. This isn't two an analysis the analyses. This is one single network with two separate uh, components. Um, so honing in on the the uh, Democrat more Democrat uh, uh, network, um, we show that uh, Joe Biden is at the center. And so that means, you know, if I trust uh, Maddow, I trust Joe Biden. If I, if I trust my governor, I trust Joe Biden. That's that center. Um, and then there's this relationship between if I trust Fauci, I trust my personal doctor. And the way you kind of want to read this is the trusting your doctor is a more commonly held belief. And then the ones that are kind of point things that are it's, think of it as directional towards the more commonly held belief. Hold Fauci is le a little bit less trusted in the total population than people who are responding, I trust my doctor, but people who tend to trust Fauci tend to trust their doctor. Um, so now getting to the to the uh, conspiracy stuff, this is uh, the, um, the, the more Republican oriented cluster with in terms of political uh, trust. Um, so we can first see that um, in not the 9-11 conspiracy theory only implicates other beliefs. So this is probably one of the least widely held beliefs um, in the data set. Um, the, on the other hand, the violent protest belief is only implicated by other beliefs and trust in Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump. Now, we can think of this also as there's probably some level of temporality. So these are more recent events. Um, and so they're going to be more being held in some way that's more common in the in the in the general uh, population. Um, so you've picked a side, then uh, there's a small number of people that are are believing that 9/11 wasn't uh, was some uh, cover up or something. Um, sec. Uh, so trust in one's priest. Uh, autism is that a uh, vaccine causes autism and the moon landing ho hoax are are more peripheral, um, but they lead. So like in the same way, the doctor in the previous slide was the more commonly held one. Priest is more commonly held. Um, so these in general, because they have one implication instead of the, 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 um, the 9-11 hoax, these are more a little more in, enmeshed and in, in, um, in embedded as conspiracy beliefs than, say, 9-11. And, and that can make things more difficult to kind of remove that belief because it's it's tied in um, uh, the kind of the mo most, uh, what do I want to call it, the most embedded enmeshed beliefs are the climate belief and COVID lab. And these because these were highly politicized events, especially uh, COVID-19 lab during um, the 2020 election cycle. And climate change has become a a conversation piece for um for for republican um, politicians um and this is also really highly linked to trust in tucker uh, carlson and trump so in a lot of ways these beliefs are going to be much harder to work on um than uh, the other ones so overall um what you have are inclusion exclusion and mutual co-exhaustion beliefs and when you look at the cross-cutting relationships so the the two clusters from the um, the inclusion network, you see that exclusions and mu mutual co-exhaustions are cross-cutting. And this speaks to the nature of how we're finding that um, there are certain trust in certain officials protect or embolden uh, certain beliefs. Um, so that's that. So in terms of uh, discussion in future directions, I, I think I might have uh, gone a little too fast. I'm sorry about that. But I hope hopefully we can, we can have a stimulating conversation about um, this work. And I have some other slides if we want to talk about uh, demo demographic features, um, but I can go into that. So um, so overall discussion, 
Um, there's a uh, there's obvious polarization between the beliefs and trust in the mental model when you're looking at this like the backbone of it. Um, it reveals the extent to the entrenchment and embeddedness of, of some of these beliefs. So the climate change and COVID-19 lab belief are highly embedded. Um, so going back to the high tension aspect of these beliefs, um, the QAnon belief was, to me at least, was surprisingly embedded, um, it, which speaks to it becoming more widely held. Um, and following um, Stark and Bainbridge, they have a note in the back of the in the back of the book basically that speaks to um, populist movements kind of emboldening and often reviving um, religious uh, high tension beliefs. And so I think there might be something there to be said about populist movements kind of catching fire with uh, uh, um, more high tension beliefs like QAnon. I mean, the idea that we're going to stand outside and we're going to watch someone come back to life, I believe is probably at odds with the sociocultural, uh, you know, world we live in. Um, so the, there's also, it identifies least amenable targets for information campaigns. So ones like um, the autism is caused by vaccines is probably among the high, the more, of the more, uh, amenable to intervention. It's not as embedded politically because in honesty, if, if you look at the history of that, it comes from a uh, uh, a more of a working, uh, educated background um, in California where that kind of movement began. So it, it is cross-cutting politically, um, but it is so closely associated with those other conspiracy beliefs. Um, and it shows that trust in public figures can protect or buttress from these, these high tension beliefs. Um, so my future directions, um, I'm gonna, uh, there are ways that you can then see which ones might be more amenable by identifying cut points, um, identifying which ones are the least embedded in the network, you know, and, and having a, a, st a statistic cutoff for that. Um, there is also more to do with the, the description of these high tension beliefs. So you could rank the ones that are the most embedded or not um, and compare the centrality measures of those beliefs. Um, it would also be interesting to look at if you take if you have less conservative cutoffs to see in which ways the, uh, the these values change. Do you see that what's the backbone, but what is kind of like, you know, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. Um, and so I also need to apply fully uh, the approach to the full data set. There's questions about uh, the 2020 election results, concern about false and misinformation, um, and also social media and foreign interference, which are super interesting. But when you have all of that in the network, it, it starts to visually be uh, a little bit um, overstimulating. Um, so... Uh, so for today, you know, I, the things I, I want to kind of, I'd love to hear from y'all, um, the approach, uh, since this approach is a general approach, it can be applied to any data set as long as you have individuals who answer similar survey questions. And so I'd, I'd love to have thoughts on um, if you have a data set, cyber, you know, social cybersecurity or anything, you know, in what ways would you be, would this be interesting to look at kind of the patterns underneath the hood of your, your data set? Um, the second is how this idea of a mental model of an aggregate population, which I feel there are some there is some modern literature on it, but I don't think it's in the policy implications. It's mostly in the sociology of culture, which in a lot of ways tends to not be so uh, in, uh, worried about what the meaning, what the meaning or the impact in the society it will be. Um, and so, you know, at least in here, we're seeing that there are, identif there are identified thought leaders. And what does that mean in terms of uh, policy rollout and, and that? Um, and finally, I'd love to hear thoughts or suggestions on simulation or other approaches that can be used in this data set or others. Um, you know, I'm thinking I've done some work on um, dynamic um, node removal studies. Um, in this case, we only have a single case, so we can only talk about robustness. But I think... This is similar to the idea of, of cut points. Um, and so with that, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I'd love to hear questions, thoughts, and you know, uh, if you wish I went slower, you know, you know let me know that, but um, thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Renshaw. This was a very thought-provoking lecture. Um, and your reference to Stark and Bainbridge reminded me of my first grant proposal, whose program officer was Bill Bainbridge. No way. Cool. <laughs> So that reminds me a lot of discussions that I had with Bainbridge on uh, social movements and uh, right. uh, individual, collective, transdisciplinary aspects, emotions of social yeah. movements. So thank you for uh, bringing those memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted to also ask you, this is such an interesting concept um, of entailments, yeah. uh, belief networks. Um, do you think this can also be used to let's say combat or mitigate uh, misinformation or how trust is eroding in democratic and scientific institutions? Yeah, I, I mean, it really, so what's what's cool about the the data, about this approach is it's it's really flexible for whatever data set you have. I mean, and it's really the, the, the origins of it being in anthropology, what they were trying to study is stuff like, you know, what is, if the society doesn't have a sense of, of hierarchy or class, I mean, there is, there is a natural kind of hierarchy, but if they can't identify it, you know, it might be a, a fishing village and they ask people, you know, do you have a fishing rod? Do you have a boat? Do you have a, um, you know, a net? And if you ask a certain amount of people, the people that tend to be uh, higher or whatever within the, the community have the majority of those items. Anyway, in terms of looking at, um, within mis and disinformation. I mean, I could see this being used in terms of, of Twitter. The problem there is you really have to select on the case. Um, I find that, we, and especially converting, you know, be, going from uh, sociology, being a computational sociologist to being in a computer science department, um, we have these giant data sets. And the question of like, what what does it all mean? And I, and I think that's a challenge. Um, and I think identifying those people who are kind of like in this case, we have like Tucker Carlson, people who are really buttressing and, and are embedded with these um, um, high tension beliefs. Um, that makes those beliefs harder to work on. Because if I, if you really love Tucker Carlson, and then I try, I try to get you to, um, you know, believe something about climate change, it's not going to fit. I mean, I think. Something else that also come, that comes to mind right now is the issue of um, balance theory in um, in the social networks literature. Um, it's this idea that you know you have these positive and negative ties, and you try to cognitively you try to balance um, those relationships. Um, and in that case, it's hard to balance something when the other there's obviously this relationship. So anyway, I mean, I'd love to know kind of what data y'all have and and what what kind of questions you would have with this. Um, but I do think it, it, it's, it can be used to identify people sharing on certain topics, um, you know, especially identities, having certain identities. Um, it's really uh, allows for the richer the data set, the, the richer the, the descriptive ability the, the method has, so. Amazing. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, and I'm sure there are also other questions as well as thoughts, ideas uh, from our participants as they're also working on several projects yeah. which do collect data from the platforms, which you also uh, sort of put that in your future work or research questions. So let's let's open the floor for Q&A. And whoever has any questions, please go ahead and mute yourself and ask your question. Go ahead, please. Yes, this is Tim Zimmerman. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm driving in a rainstorm here, so. Oh, no. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, are you seeing this primarily as a binary situation, or a, do you have a, are you looking at the data from a spectrum? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of the data cleaning process to get it to to do to to do the analysis, you have to binarize the data. You have to say this is that. Now, you could do different cuts of the data. I could say, instead of looking at, if I wanted to highlight, and I think this is, I've, I've been suggested this, and I, I'd like to look into it a little bit more, um, focusing on the don't knows. So if I make a contrast, instead of it being um, people who hold the belief or don't hold the belief, or the people who are like on the fence, 
if you do that, that network could actually in a lot, maybe I, you know, should just do it. Um, but that might show the people that are more, what are the beliefs of people who are amenable to change? Because if we think about polarization and about the, and like I just said, the balance theory aspect of, of, of kind of cognitively trying to, you know, square the circle. Um, I think uh, maybe working on the people that are more on the fence. Now, the other problem is it's a survey. If I'm uncomfortable because the answer that I think I should be giving is less desirable, and I, we see this a little bit with questions about QAnon, is a, a little bit of an is a pretty compared to the other beliefs is a little bit of an increase in people who say don't know, um, and that might be literally they they don't know enough to really say true uh, truly, but maybe there's a desirability effect. They don't they don't really want to say that they believe that JFK is going to come back from the dead and and that so. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think in another way you could look at more of a spectrum other than kind of switching the, the, the variables that you look and then taking kind of a, um, an ensemble look of, you know, those, uh, responses, you can also cut to change the, the cutoff for the, the, the test, um, and then look at, well, when I keep doing cuts on this data set, you know, these are the really durable ones, but there are also, it's a spectrum. There are some other relationships that are, are cross-cutting or or something like that. So I, I appreciate the comment because it, it, you know, it, re it also reminded me of the the don't knows. So, and I need to, I need to get back to that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I answered your question though. <laughs> you you kind of did. And then you mentioned Twitter there just briefly. Yep. Would that would that be a way to append to the survey data possibly and update some of those concepts to more recent? Uh, yeah. So I mean, data? yeah. So in the case of this data, unless NPR went out and and surveyed this the same population that they surveyed, I I don't I wouldn't want to bring in other data because it really the the base level requires you to have the same respondents. For multiple periods, the the uh, general social survey, um, you can have a belief network at a given year, and then look at how it changes over the over years. Again, also in terms of uh, of social you know, Twitter and social media, um, you know, if you have uh, certain accounts and you want to see how they're talking about a certain topic, or how the population is uttering, you know, I believe or I think, um, you could make your own data set that allows for for that. Um, but it, then it, the question is, you have to have a certain set of actors. So I've done research in the past with the National Weather Service and also public uh, health communication where we we really picked, uh, I mean, the National Weather Service is an organization. There's only 150 members uh, or offices that are on Twitter. So that was the set. And I could analyze, you know, how they present um, different, you know, weather beliefs over the course. And this is not uh, maybe the right case, but for the uh, COVID-19 um, case, you if you had just a list of, of po politicians and you had their responses over time, there is, you would have to, it's it's hard because you'd have to have them answer or, or utter the same belief multiple times within some period of time. Um, so it, it is kind of like, a, there are ways to analyze it on a one-off basis. I think that's probably the, the Twitter case is probably, you have people uttering that they believe or don't believe something. And then you just look at that. The overtime aspect is going to be a lot harder because you have to observe someone so publicly uttering that they believe QAnon. And then at some other point, observe that they say, I don't believe QAnon. And that's a little more difficult to, I think, get a data set on. But it's a great, idea. great, great thoughts, though. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, I was about to ask the what would the limitation actually uh, if you apply to the social media data, but you already answered it over here, so I don't have anything to ask. But yeah, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, I can point to some interesting participants. Scientin, what do you think? Uh, yeah, so um, 
Uh, I was listening to this and I think uh, this is something we uh, may or may not do in our Malaysia project because there also we are trying to do some social network analysis and afterwards, like the way you are doing the mental mapping part, where we are also planning to do some focal structure related work. So I think uh, it will be also pretty interesting to implement these particular concepts in um, our current work as well. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. I'd, I'd love to, you know, at some point, if you want to reach out, feel free. I'd, I'd love to chat about it. Sure, sure. Thanks. And I, and I think this this approach, um, the the structural entailment analysis approach can be applied to, to survey data, can be applied to any, I mean, um, I'd be interested to know um, you, if you had politicians over time and you look at their their strategies of using the um, using the medium, um, so like photos or or hashtags, you could actually create a mental. Uh, it's a mental map, but it's about shared, you know, um, uh, use of of, of items um, and try to get at are there combinations? Because it's not only saying okay, th this person uses this thing. The network is has more information kind of in it about hierarchy, about embeddedness that's kind of implicated because of the test that you did. Um, so I think if, you're, if your question is interested in, um, you know, in what ways is some political figure in a topic space more embedded? I mean, you could look at how, you know, their, their degree or whatever, but if you want, if you had information on the things that they talk about, the things other people talk about, you could then see in terms of a, a different topic spaces, are they more or less embedded and who kind of con controls or, or is like, you know, uh, operating in that space in a sense. Um, so there's a lot to think about. It doesn't even have to be seen as a mental model necessarily. It can be seen as a, as a, um, you know, a, uh, a network of hierarchical relationships within the, the, the patterns of behavior. Right. So in uh, like currently um, we are looking at two different projects for one of the uh, project is collective actions and the Indo-Pacific initiatives. So after we did the social network analysis, we are seeing some interesting actors are popping out from that social sure. network analysis. Yeah. So because like in that uh, analysis, we are seeing like political actors that there, the media outlets actors are there as well. So we are also interested to know, like, if the media outlets are actually, um, you know, initiating these kinds of mass mobilizations or they are actually sure, uh, sure. doing it in backwards. So, yeah, that's something interested to see. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I, you know, I, I would have to think a little bit more about, uh, you know, how you would get the data in a form of, uh, I mean, if, if I can share my screen again, let me... Um, so you'd have to get your data in the form of this. So you have um, uh, individuals on the row responding to different things. And so if your case is, um, you know, Twitter users in some in some context, some conversational context, if they're saying, you know, um, uttering like COVID nineteen is a um, was made in a lab. Um, then they'd have a one here. And then you could look at, do they, you know, are they someone that's connected to some other person in the data? So I don't know why my computer is doing that. <laughs> anyway, um, so in that case, you would have to figure out like, what is what are the common questions you're asking the covariates and then what users? And then that's uh, a way to, then you do this, this statistical test to see what the kind of hierarchical relationships are. Sure. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. Let's see. What? Dilofer, what do you think? You're muted just in case, Dilofer, you're speaking. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Um... I, I think it was really interesting and we can apply it in our work too. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Shadi, what do you think? Uh, yes, first, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting. 
Um, yeah, I, I was listening to all of the question and um, and also the answer. Also, in uh, yeah, you can apply in our project, especially you know, my topic is related to the finding suspicious commenter behavior uh, on the YouTube channel and you know detecting the clicks. So uh, about the you know the suspicious clicks that they have, you know. Uh, some influence on some other, you know, people that actually influence that um, uh, try to boost the engagement, you know, of the um, videos. And this is that is all. All of them are very useful to use in our project. Thank you so much. Hey, you're very welcome. If anyone you know wants to reach out and talk about their research, sure. yeah, of course, then, uh, reach out. Of course, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Right. Let's see. Who else do we have? Lutena, any thoughts? Yeah, I don't have any specific thoughts um, right now, but I guess, I don't I don't know if I missed this, but I wanted to ask if the paper is published. I know you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that um, I think it's still a work in pro pro progress. So I guess I could also just kind of review it if it's published. Yeah, so it's it's not published. Um, it uh, You know, fingers crossed, um, it's a... Uh, a tentative except for a special issue on anti-science um, and social forces. So, you know, we'll hope that that one threads the needle um, and we won't know for a little bit, but um, yeah, it, I can, if, if anyone wants, I can, um, I can send the PowerPoint. Um, and I, I guess I should, in terms of uh, maybe talk about a little, the kind of demographic things that I, I noticed, um, especially within in, mis and disinformation, because I know that this group is, is really interested in that. Um, the one finding, uh, if you include the covariate of uh, some college and less or educated, so this is like educated or people with less um, education, um, the relationship, there's no, and at that, and at this really extreme cutoff, so it's, it, we're not looking at kind of like soft relationships, we're looking at like the durable backbone, there's only one uh, connection. There's only one implication for being more or less educated at that cutoff. And maybe the cutoff is too conservative. Maybe that's, you know, there's a level of, in, for future analysis, I should do different cutoffs. Um, but the the one relationship between for the less less or more educated is if I'm, if I have less education, I am not concerned. There is foreign in interference on social media um, uh, for, for, uh, in terms of mis and disinformation. So it has, it does, it's not connected to the, con the conspiracy theories. It isn't connected, uh, highly in the, the political, um, two components. It's its own side thing. It's only connected to itself. And I found that to be really interesting because it speaks to, um, what kinds of people are susceptible to, um, that sort of mis and disinformation. And, and in fact, maybe, I mean, just because I am, you know, if I say I am not concerned, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the people who are saying I am concerned are any better at discerning dis and misinformation. Um, but I, I thought that was an interesting, I and mean, that's an early, uh, you know, result, but, um, I found that to be kind of, curious that it didn't fall with you know I, i'm my assumption was it would be related in some way to these conspiracy theories you know i think we kind of assume like there's something going on there but there there it wasn't at least at that level of of um conservative cutoff so um, but if there's any other questions i i you know or thoughts or you know suggestions even I, i'd love to love to hear it Absolutely. Um, let's see. Do we have any other thoughts, questions from anyone? Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rancho. This was like really uh, a very good presentation. I would say that Dr. Ensign, uh, we we can with Dr. Rual, uh, we can use this for the narrative analysis tool too, uh, because you, we're using this like uh, maybe just uh, to see how uh, some entities are embedded in the transcript. Uh, these videos just share it in the tool so it's going to be like really interesting um, and the individual survey is interesting thank you for sharing that um, 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you so much. I, you know, I thank might you. mention, you said you have transcript data that you're analyzing? Exactly. It's from the videos, like transcript from the videos, that's, YouTube that's videos. Super, that's super cool. Um, I, I would highly suggest you to look into relational event models. I don't know if you've, if you've done mm. so. Um, gotcha. so. I've done some prior research, and if you email me, I can send it to you um, on transcripts from inside the World Trade Center and analyzing the, the radio transcripts between people within the, um, the, the World Trade Center during the attack. Um, so for transcript data, um, highly recommend uh, a relational event model approach. Gotcha. Perfect. I noted that. Uh, thank you for thank sharing you. that. Reach out to me and I'll, and we'll talk more about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Remy? Yeah, Remy, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, say thank you for that um, wonderful presentation. It's quite uh, enlightening. Um, but I'd like to ask a question because um, one of the projects I'm currently working on has to do with uh, statistical evaluation. So um, I would like to know, is there a kind of like statistical proof to this um, analysis, to this findings? Uh, I would like to know if there's any. Yeah, so the the uh, the process. I mean, if if you're talking about uh, a, it depends on what you mean by proof. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, in the case of this, we're looking at relationships that are statistically significant at a certain threshold, um, and the threshold I'm using is highly conservative, and I'm doing that so I can see the really the, the kind of the backbone of those relationships. Um, if you make it, if you actually make it. Um, if you, if you increase the, the conservative cutoff, it becomes Gutman-like scaling. So I only will have a relationship between A and B if there are no relationships that are not within that in the data set. So it has to be anytime I see, you know, when I'm a jet, I'm a jet all the way. And everyone in the data set, if they're a jet, they're, they're a jet. Um, and in, that, in this case, we have people that, you know, uh, there is a tendency in the entire data set to believe something and then also believe something else. But there are other people that don't maybe hold one and not the other. Um, but when you do the conservative cutoff, you're saying there's a certain threshold. I'm willing to say this is a really durable relationship. Um, so statistically, there is that's there. Um, but I don't know if you if you mean something different by proof. Uh, uh, no, uh, well, that, that, that does it, uh, okay. makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what you said makes sense. Yeah. Um, overall, I, I, I really appreciate your, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. If there are no other questions or, uh, parts, we, uh, can thank our speaker once again. Thank you, Dr. Renshaw for speaking to the group and such a lively discussion.